Welcome to the Influence Industry interview series brought to you by Tactical Tech. We interview experts to understand the technologies, the companies and the personalities behind political campaigns across the world. If you want to find out more, check out influenceindustry.org. Eliana, before we dive into talking about your work, I'm curious how you found yourself working in this space in the first place. What led you to take an interest in digital issues? So my perhaps my first contact with internet was through my brother, who is a computer science engineer. So it was very early, back in the 80s. Uh, he used to tell me about the international communities that he was involved in. And he was coding and hacking and sharing knowledge. And for me, it sounded so cool. And um, also with the, a sense of uh, being contributing to a cause. So, um, like, it, it, it has been there all the time from from the beginning of my 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 life in, uh, in the school and then the university. But the... It was uh, at um, at 2008 when I went to a meeting here in Bolivia, a, a meeting of bloggers. Uh, when I was really like engaged with this with this world, and it was uh, this meeting of bloggers. It was full of activists and people with social interest. It was really amazing. From there, I became a um, a Twitter user, a Twittera, let's say in Spanish. And from that moment, uh, I really got in love. I fell in love with the, with all this world. And then I began a job. Uh, it was a surprise for me, but I began a job in United Nations uh, with amazing people who gave me the, the opportunity and all the support to develop projects around democracy and technology. It was a, a very original job in in Bolivia. There weren't any um, projects using technology for any anything related to development or democracy. So it was for me. It was amazing to have that opportunity. And from that point, my life changed completely. Half of my life was in the bureaucracy. I was always a bureaucrat. I also defined myself I, as a person in the desk, but the other half was an activist, an activist for digital rights. So yeah, I guess that's kind of my journey. I suspect, um, and correct me if I'm wrong, but probably around 2008, there was very much this sense and promise and belief in the democratizing force of the internet. And I hope that that hasn't been lost completely, but I think we've learned many lessons, in many ways, the hard way along the way. Yes, I guess it was very different because it was a small and uh, the people who were inside, especially Twitter, that is not really a big, it has never been and it's not, uh, now it's not a really big social media. There were people who were very curious, trying to help, trying to collaborate between them and also trying to be good for the world. So it was a very nice place to, to work on. Uh, after that, we found that, of course, there were also some um, hate speech and then uh, fake accounts. But in that very moment, it was not the case. It was very a very nice space. And we did things like a campaign calling for peace and dialogue and also sharing information about political dialogue. Now it's not possible to do something like that without taking into account and understanding that there are other intentions, not so good intentions in, in social media. So social media has got now uh, also uh, this, this layer of uh, bad and ugly things, you know. Explain what it is that makes working on digital rights in South America or maybe even Bolivia specifically unique. Are there particular challenges or opportunities to the context? There's a point where it's very similar to, I guess, other 
realities or their people's lives being an activist is overwhelming, you know. We always need to be informed all the time and understanding the size of, of all the things that are coming up and popping up. We have to look for opportunities to bring our topics and our positions into the into the table, you know. So it's it's very stressful. And perhaps it's a little bit more stressing here because all the big debate is in English or in Portuguese, because Brazil is, of course, is a very interesting uh, place to, to look at the digital right. And even in French, I have the feeling that it, I'm always translating and not only translating the, um, the language, but also like the, the cultural experiences coming from English realities or Europe and trying to um, understand myself and also help other people to understand what are the implication of this, this debate. I'm always trying to figure out this translation and also the translation from my reality, the reality of my country. And it's a poor country, even though we have been the last 10 or 15 years, we have been the the country that grow the most in the region, but we are still a, a poor country. Around 70% of the people uses internet, but only 30%, around 30% are, has connection at home. So it's a very poor connection that we have here. Of course, I'm trying to compete with some topics of development topics, for example, water and sanitation services, or even food and trying to make up my mind, understanding that also to be connected is a very important topic. And as I say, I try perhaps to compete with all the topics that perhaps are more basic. Yeah, it's always, at least for myself, it's trying to understand and trying to make a logic and a narrative that is important for the people. And also, I understand, of course, some problems are bigger here. Digital gap, for example, is a, a very big issue. Perhaps not in the countries of the North is not so big. And also the, uh, to live like an, uh, an under-regulated reality. For example, we had a, um, an experience, I don't remember how, how many years ago, but perhaps six uh, years ago, Facebook had an experiment here, here and in five uh, countries more and it was an experiment with the, uh, their own platform uh, making some changes these changes uh, um, um, lead us to have some problems with the news and with the public information but it was okay because of course we are anti-regulated Facebook will not uh, face any problem uh, making some experiments in this type of countries so I guess that's kind of my reality, underregulated, poor people, other their needs to consider also. I find very interesting, you know, so much of the scholarship even is in English and the process of digesting and reading, consuming all of this, understanding it, then trying to communicate how it's different in your local reality and then translating it back to these communities. I can see how doing this kind of is a never-ending act of translation. And is zero rating common in Bolivia? Yes, it is. We don't call it uh, zero rating or free basics. They just say that, uh, the companies just say that WhatsApp for free or Facebook for free. So um, almost all the companies offer that when the credit they, the users buy, is ended, so they have WhatsApp running still. So they don't, they are not really connected, but they they have especially WhatsApp, not not really too much uh, Facebook. Yes, but it's very common, and that's kind of a problem, of course. I was just thinking, in case people listen to this and they don't know what zero rating is, it's when like a mobile data provider or an ISP, an internet service provider doesn't charge people money for their data use on particular websites and services. So in this case, for example, you know, you can use WhatsApp to your heart's content, no data limits or charges on your use of WhatsApp. But of course you are confined to WhatsApp. If someone sends you an article about a story, you don't really have the ability to 
go to the internet and fact check it independently. For example, you're confined to to the particular service that they're not charging you for. It's amazing because it's not it's not the case only that the people cannot go to and browse any news, but they don't know how to. They don't know that 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 world exists for so many people. WhatsApp is internet. What they do in WhatsApp is internet, and and they don't relate either. A WhatsApp with internet. If you ask them, do you use internet? They would say no. But if you ask, do you use WhatsApp? They would say yes. So it's kind of it's amazing. It's a, another reality, and it's not only in between users. Some authorities, even some authorities, think like that and have this experience. It's like some problems that we are working on, let's say data protection, personal data protection. To begin to explain, it's so difficult sometimes because I can't find any example from their lives like to relate with the, with the, with the problem. So it's very difficult. Of course, it's not always the case. It's not with everybody, but it's not so uncommon to find groups of, or, or people who are uh, having this experience. Then became a little bit more difficult because when we look for some funds, funders are not, uh, donors are not uh, always uh, understanding this reality. So the money that we can apply for, they, it's not always uh, taking into account this reality and we cannot really solve or try to solve these problems, these basic problems. So sometimes we can find ourselves as activists working on uh, issues that are kind of cool in, the, in our field, like artificial intelligence, that is not really the biggest problem. The biggest problems in, in, in digital rights, perhaps in Bolivia. It's, it's interesting to, to understand the, the problems of uh, artificial intelligence, but it's not really the reality here. Tell me about internetbolivia.org, the organization you founded, its work, and maybe even some highlights or successes you and the team have had over the years. The first word that comes to my mind, thinking about my, my organization, uh, Fundación Internet Bolivia, is that it's a warm place. <laughs> I have the best team ever. Uh, we found it with uh, uh, Christian Leon and Cielito Sarabia, the three of us in 2008. And we are working now in five areas. Um, we are working on gender-based violence and digital security. The second is uh, data protection. The third one is digital inclusion. Of and then digital economy that we are trying to understand all the implications, not, not only to innovate and how to grow, but also what are the implications uh, taking into account digital rights uh, on, on the digital economy and digital government. And we found that um, levels are, are the, the key. So we are focusing on this area on municipal and local uh, governments, not in the national government. So trying to understand uh, how the digital rights look like in, um, in uh, municipalities and rural areas. Some, some things that I'm proud about is to put data protection as a concept in the media and in the institutional agenda. Previously, like uh, before we, we began to work in data protection, nobody was talking about that and nobody knew about that in, in Bolivia. At, at least not in the in the public sphere. And then uh, perhaps our project, our oldest project, is uh, this gender-based online violence. We are the first one and, and still the, the, the only ones giving some attention to victims of uh, digital uh, violence, online violence, because of this um, originality, let's say. A lot of institutions... Uh, public institutions and also uh, NGOs ask for advice from us to to share the experience with them. Perhaps the the last thing, how these digital rights look like in the in a rural context with indigenous people who are have very poor connections or even they are not connected. So uh, talking about, for example, data protection, how is data protection? personal data protection 
looks like in small town or a, a rural community. So we are working during this year in, in that uh, third topic. Thanks for sharing that. It was interesting to hear you say that you're focused on municipal and local governments and not on national governments. Can you tell me a little bit more about that? So, of course, we are working with the national level, but not in e-government, not in the topic of e-government. We are working with the national government in data protection, but also at the municipal level. Of course, we're working on this gender-based violence and then security, digital security issues in, in the national level, but not in the in, in e-government itself. And of course, we began working with uh, all the topics with the national level, but with the problems that we had, this 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 political crisis and the the pandemic, it was impossible to move anything in the national level. So we said, okay, if we want to do something, perhaps the local level is a very nice place to go. And yes, we found there that the the, the, the problems, the, the national problems, were not really a big problem or a big issue in the in some localities. So we ba- began talking with, the, with local actors, and the local actors have other problems. And for example trying to work on data protection. We found, of course, in the municipality of Coroico, we found that they were not, they don't have databases in the municipality. Everything is in paper. Right. So they said, your idea is very interesting, but how can we work on protecting data protection online if we are not online? So, so we found a middle, like a middle level between them and our, our interests very transparent, let's say. We said, yeah, but we are we have money and we are interested in working on data protection. Let's um, help you to modernize your, your public administration and we can build some databases, but these databases will have privacy by design. So it will include from the very beginning some notions of data protection. So it's, yeah, we, we are working on that now and it's a, a very nice and a very, very good way to, to, to go. So the idea was also in the, in the, while we, we were working that, of course, we are working for the people, but the debate is very global and the people is not in the global. People live they only, they, their daily lives in the local level. There should be a way to connect these this global debates that, will always take place in the global space. Let's say the, the most interesting debates will be always in the in global levels because this is a global problem. But the people who are suffering the problem are in the local level. So we are not really clear on that still, but we have some findings and we have some notions until now and we have the decision that to to still to, to keep uh, working on the local level and trying to find these connections, trying to bring the local interests and concerns to the global debate and also um, bringing this discussion uh, from the global level to the local. So we have one year working on this, not really for a long time, but yeah, there should be a connection or some connections in this between these levels. You were just talking about the political crisis in Bolivia, and you were focused on identifying disinformation ecosystems around the time of this crisis from like October 2019 to October 2020. But I tried to give a very brief summary, and you can correct me if I'm wrong because you know so much more about this than I do, but just to help set the stage a little bit, October 2019, elections were held in Bolivia, and then there were mass protests afterwards when allegations of fraud and voting irregularities emerged. The president at the time, Evo Morales, faced a rebellion from the police, and he was requested by the military to resign, and and he did. Um, And after that, a transitional government under Janine Añez came into power with the support of the military, but under her, Bolivian state forces um, seemed guilty of tons of human rights violations, suppressing protests, killing dozens of indigenous Bolivians, detaining countless people, persecuting political opponents, intimidating the press, arresting journalists, and so on. 
And so new elections were set, but ended up being postponed three times, I believe, due to the pandemic. But they finally took place in October of 2020. And Louis Arce, the former finance minister, was then elected as president. And if I understand correctly, it seems that Janine Añez, the the interim head of state, has meanwhile been sentenced for up to 10 years in prison for breach of her constitutional duties. Last I read, I think it sounds like the decision is going to be appealed. Is is that an okay summary? It is. It is interesting to to listen to other people talking about this because, of course, it's a very emotional moment that we lived, we all Bolivians lived. It's good, like, to have some some version because it's all all the time there are versions without any emotional content or let's say trying to don't don't compromise the content. So yeah, I agree. I must agree. Of course, there are a lot of things inside, but yes, everything is correct. And this was the period of time that you were examining and. It sounds like you found that um, there were kind of certain political interests that were using money to promote illegitimate behavior. Yes, let's say Bolivia is a poor country, so we don't really have a lot of money to invest during elections. But we have, during this period, not only crisis, but also three elections processes and also a lot of international actors. So it's a very good period to work on, to, to research on in Bolivia, because it's not the, the, all the common case in Bolivia to have so much money and so much so many international actors, what we have. So my, my topic is about an identification of the ecosystem of disinformation, like, uh, let's say, a national ecosystem of disinformation, so it's a scheme, and this scheme identified 10 types of actors playing in an eco, in a national, I have the ambitious like, uh, to say that any eco, a national ecosystem of disinformation. So we have these uh, financial donors, let's say, we have also this uh, political will that we need somewhere in some actors, some people who are preparing and making up the strategies the strategy is only I'm talking about not for all the campaign, all the political campaign, but specifically for the digital political campaign. And then, of course, what you found, and it's not really common in the literature, these data providers and data analysts. Because if you want to uh, run an uh, disinformation ecosystem, you need data. And if you don't have, let's say here in Bolivia, there are not really many many databases that you can use, but there are some. So it was also very interesting to understand, to try to understand how it looks like being a data provider or data analyst in Bolivia. It's a very underdeveloped market on data, but we found some. And then, of course, you need, once you have these databases, you need the communications team, no? like the people who are producing pieces of uh, communication, and then they uh, send it to a a sphere of spreading the the information. Massive actors, interactive actors, and also the citizens in a a sphere that are sharing information and spreading information and viralizing information. But before that, I found, and I think that's um, an interesting finding, is uh, legitimacy or let's say credibility providers. Because in this whole ecosystem only works if some people believe on the information that is going around the ecosystem. So you need some figures, let's say, some people who are bringing legitimacy and credibility to the um, to the whole system and especially of course the messages that are being spread um, and these are for example this can be uh, political authorities uh, based on the trust the citizens gave to them when they elected them and it's the case of Trump or Bolsonaro in, in Brazil they are spreading this information and people believe them because they want to believe course, but based on the uh, status they have when they have been elected. 
But also you will find some people like influencers. Uh, I guess the the case of uh, Philippines is a very interesting case on that with the Mocha girl who were uh, a K-popper, but they were really, they have millions of people in their social media. So some people, not all the, not the whole society, but some people trusted these girls, teenagers, especially young people. And they, uh, the platforms they have to uh, support Duterte. So you have, again, a credibility actor there. Perhaps what they were saying, it was not really truth or it was half truth, but the teenagers, they were following them. They will believe everything that they said. And there also you will find some journalists and media, these washer media, like the intermediate media that are not really mainstream or independent media, but they are like clickbait media. But I guess it's especially journalists because in Bolivia, but also in the world, journalists are going through a very special um, situation. They are stressed, media are stressed because of this uh, need to adapt to the digital world, you know. So especially the mainstream, the big media, they need to adapt to the world, to the, this new world. Very few uh, media have found a way to not lose money and to maintain themselves in the digital world. The, the most common cases are media reducing people or, or have really very few journalists, maintain their few journalists as their staff. So you have a lot of journalists in the streets looking for some help. And in, in the case of Bolivia, it's a very special situation. Before this, this stress of digitalization, they were not really being paid uh, well. And now it's really worse, the situation. And you, you will find a lot of people who knows about the, the information ecosystem. They, they, they have a know-how. They know how, to, to, how this ecosystem works, but they don't have any job. So they are kind of easy to convince to play a, a role in this ecosystem, this information ecosystem. And they will put in, in, in value their credibility as journalists. So they are this type of actors. All of them are bringing some kind of credibility and some kind of legitimacy to the ecosystem. Um, in the case of the second category, these kind of influencers or micro-influencers, are you aware of any exchange of money? Uh, so the way that I built this ecosystem scheme is reading everything that is, not everything, but uh, literature that is outside Bolivia. So first, whatever is uh, written outside Bolivia, it was worth, and I identified this scheme. After that, I uh, try to interpret, uh, find information from Bolivia reality to check if this scheme works for Bolivia. So I was talking about Philippines because the first step of for to build this scheme. Influencers are usually, uh, I will say usually, but perhaps always local. But when a marketing company uh, is beginning to develop a campaign and uh, a disinformation campaign in a country, one of the first things that will they will do is to identify these local influencers and try to pay them for doing something, some uh, spreading some some information. But sometimes, as in Philippines, the the Mocha girls, I think they they perhaps they they receive money from the government. No, I don't think from a marketing company, but they will really support in Duterte because they were interested in politics. At least the leader, she was interested in politics because she wanted to get into politics and actually was president. He hired her for the communications ministry or vice ministry, I guess. I, I don't remember the exact uh, name of the public institution. So it was a political interest. But you will find here, I found some information about some influences that have been paid for the, the digital marketing or PR communications and whatever company that were hired for disinformation campaigns. So I made myself the, the question, if I am contracted for a campaign, a disinformation campaign, what are the steps I will do? If I'm 
doing this uh, as a as professional, let's say, what I will do. And uh, the first thing is to, to, to duplicate uh, media sites. Media sites not only as a, as a website, but also uh, fan pages in, in Facebook and accounts in uh, social media. So trying to attract people because they will think that you are the real one. And then the second one, the, the second thing, to um, try to find these local influencers and local content creators because they will need some communication pieces locally constructed. For example, if they say something in WhatsApp, in Bolivia, for example, of course, it's the same in, in the whole world. They will speak in as we are speaking La Paz in the south of La Paz because we have different ways of speaking, of pronouncing the R in La Paz, in the south, in the north, or and we are not a big city. We are one million population. So it was amazing to understand that they were building these this communication pieces so locally with the the words that we use the 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 sound we make with the the, the words so they need these cheap content creators and influencers so they will try to pick to to understand who are them to first to hire them and then to hire them for the production of the media production but also for spreading the information it depends on the on the place but because of course in philippines you have this big K-popers, and here you don't have that. And and uh, as far as I know, no other musician was hired, but perhaps, I'm not sure. But they do have uh, K-popers in Colombia. It was an interesting case. During the Paro Nacional, there were some K-popers, uh, how do you say, the, uh, making dirty, the hashtag of a, a Twitter. There was a campaign from the Ministry of Defense, and K-popers... Um, Use this hashtag for other other topics, not the the ones that uh, the Ministry of Defense were using for. So they were also activists in that in that sense. You were talking about, of course, any disinformation scheme requires data, and that the data market you're saying in Bolivia is quite underdeveloped, but you found a few. What kinds of organizations were these? And um, were they based themselves in Bolivia as well? In, in, in US, there are a lot of data brokers, but data brokers are not really regulated in the US, but are legal. They found a way to be legal. They say that they are not selling data, but they are renting data. Yeah. Anyway, they are kind of, of regulated and you can find legally these data brokers and you, you can buy databases, personal databases from them. But in Bolivia, it's underregulated, so we don't have these data brokers as, as itself, as legal ones. So who are them? Are there some data brokers or where if you want, if you need databases here, where you will go? First, there are some leaks uh, for example it's very famous here to say that the databases of voters have been leaked many times so if you go to a, a black market here that is a big market and everybody goes there we go there to to buy our stuff you will also find this database there a cd and it will be like five dollars to buy that <laughs> so it's kind of easy in that way and you will find some of these databases not only this one of voters but also databases of anything supermarkets or um, some public uh, database from people who were hired to to do some analysis with them and they keep a copy and then they will sell the database so it's a very how to say it's a black market it's a very enthusiastic black market and if you, if you need to develop um, a database that can show some profiles of voters, uh, you will also use information from Facebook. You will also have some more formal companies that are not based here. They mention one, Bunker de Ver, that I guess it's based in Uruguay. And they say that they have 
1,000 clients in South America. And they are selling services, profile services for political uh, campaigns, but also for commercial campaigns. And you will find a lot of uh, companies in Mexico. Mexico seems to be uh, like the, the country that has more know-how on this. And actually, I found three companies here in Bolivia uh, that were hired for uh, disinformation campaigns. And all three are based in Mexico. Yeah, so you will find also these, they are more analysts, let's say. Databases are more local and it's, you need to be here and ask like who has some some database and you will get some database and you then you need a, a data scientist to organize all these things and to clean all the databases and uh, have an, a, a sense of what you are looking for and profiling. Campaigns are aware that they need data, they are getting data and they are analyzing data for political objectives. And of course, it's what they talk about like they, they differentiate the campaign A and the campaign B. The campaign A is the clean one and the campaign B is the dark one. So data is used for both types of campaign. I understood that this is a market thing. So it's yes, it's important data, but also it's important these media producers, you know? Is small and local ones, uh, but also, for example, we we had here some media pieces that were produced in Ecuador or Venezuela. So mm -hmm. they are not local all the time. So this the whole ecosystem is driven by money. Yeah, it's, it's a market thing. So it, they are like uh, when you say they are proud of, for example, they have a lot of clients. Yes, because it's a marketing company, a marketing company without these uh, this information services will act the same. They are selling things. They are selling services. But it's the whole system. So mm, somebody has money to, to contract services. They will find uh, companies in, diff in the different phases. So is it possible to stop this? I'm not sure, really. It's, it's a market-driven ecosystem, as I see. If you like, uh, you neutralize, you you eliminate some of these credibility actors. They will pop up other one because the system need, needs function. So it's we, we should think about uh, answers for the whole ecosystem. Yes, I totally agree. It is an industry and it is market driven. Yeah, and when when a, um, a campaign doesn't have enough money. They found ways to, for example, to oblige a, a public staff to create um, bot farms because they don't have enough money. So it's again, it's the business of disinformation. It's it's good to understand, and and not all the the people who's writing about this information have this understanding of um, market, uh, like a, a an ecosystem driven. For the money. If you enjoyed today's interview and you want to find out more about the influence industry, data-driven political campaigns, and anything else about Tactical Tech's work, check out influenceindustry.org.